Greetings. Welcome to Boingo Wireless fourth quarter and full year 2000 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. Please note, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Kimberly Orlando, with Addo Investor Relations. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, and welcome to the Boingo Wireless fourth quarter and full year 2019 earnings conference call. By now, everyone should have access to the earnings press release, which was issued today at approximately 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. In addition, an earnings supplement has been made available on the investor relations portion of Boingo's website at boingo.com by clicking on the investor tab. This call is being webcast and it is available for replay. In our remarks today, we will include statements that are considered forward-looking within the meaning of securities laws, including forward-looking statements about guidance and future results of operations, business strategies and plans, our relationships with our venue partners, new venue and other contracts, and market and potential growth opportunities. In addition, management may make additional forward-looking statements in response to your question. Forward-looking statements are based on management's current knowledge and expectations as of today, March 2, 2020, and are subject to certain risks and uncertainties that may cause the actual results to differ materially from the forward-looking statement. A detailed discussion of such risks and uncertainties are contained in our most recent Form 10-K for the year ended December 31, 2019, filed with the SEC today on March 2, 2020, and our other filings with the SEC. The company undertakes no obligation to update any forward-looking statements. On this call, we will refer to non-GAAP measures, such as adjusted EBITDA and free cash flow, that when used in combination with GAAP results, provide us with additional analytical tools to understand our operations. We have provided reconciliations to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures in our earnings press release, and which will be posted on the Investor Relations section of our website at boingo.com. And with that, I'll hand the call over to Boingo's Chief Executive Officer, Mike Finley. Thanks, Kim, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Let me begin by addressing the recent news story speculating we are exploring a potential sale of the company. While we will not comment on rumors or speculation in the marketplace, we can share that we have received multiple inquiries regarding a potential strategic transaction. As such, our board has engaged strategic advisors to help us assess these opportunities. For that reason, while we will be sharing fourth quarter results with you today, we are suspending forward-looking financial guidance until further notice. With that, let me turn it over to Pete, who will walk you through our fourth quarter 2019 results in detail. Pete? Thanks, Mike. Today I'll begin by reviewing our financial results and key operating metrics for the fourth quarter from December 31st, 2019. Total revenue for the fourth quarter was $64.1 million, a decrease of 5.5% over the prior year period. Revenue reflected growth in military multifamily and wholesale Wi-Fi, which was offset by year-over-year -year declines in DAS, retail, and advertising and other revenue. As a percentage of total revenue across our diversified revenue streams compared to the prior year quarter, military multifamily was 37%, up from 35%. DAS was 35%, down from 37%. Wholesale Wi-Fi was 17%, up from 16%. Retail was steady at 5%, and advertising other was 6%, down from 7%. In terms of total revenue contribution by category for the quarter, military multifamily revenue is $24 million, representing an increase of 2.5% versus the prior year period. Growth was driven by the military vertical, which improved 4.4% year over year. We grew military subscriber revenue following the speed and price increases we implemented in the first quarter of 2019, which led to a 10.1% year-over-year increase in our proof. During the fourth quarter, we built out our network to cover an additional 1,000 military beds, bringing our total footprint to 355,000 military beds as of December 31st. Fourth quarter revenue in the multifamily vertical declined 3% year-over-year. While growth in our multifamily business is taking longer than originally anticipated due to longer sales and deployment cycles, we remain um, optimistic in our long-term growth opportunity this vertical represents. In the near term, we continue to generate strong recurring services fees for our portfolio of 238 multifamily properties. DAS revenue of 22 million decreased 3.3 million, or 12.9% year over year, primarily due to decreased DAS above project revenue. 
total DAS revenue was comprised of 13.1 million build-out project revenue and 8.9 million of access fee revenue. Importantly, recurring DAS access fee revenue increased 24.5% year over year from 7.2 million, representing our fifth consecutive quarter of double digit growth. Wholesale Wi-Fi revenue was 11.1 million, up slightly year over year, primarily due to increased managed service fees from our venue partners who pay us to install, manage, and operate network infrastructure at their venues. This increase was partially offset by decreased revenue from our Comes With Flow and Go service offering. As mentioned on previous earnings calls, we expect Comes With Flow and Go will continue to partially offset growth in the wholesale Wi-Fi vertical as our program with American Express is phased out. However, we, may, we remain pleased with the performance of carrier offloads and continue to expect wholesale Wi-Fi to be a strong driver of recurring cash flow. Retail revenue is $3.3 million, a decline of 9.7% year-over-year, primarily due to reduction in our retail subscribers. Advertising and other revenue is $3.7 million, decreased 17.5% year-over-year, primarily due to a decline in the number of premium ad units sold compared to the prior year period. Now turn to our fourth quarter costs and operating expenses. As a result of our business realignment plan announced in December, we recorded a restructuring charge totaling $2.3 million in the fourth quarter of 2019, related to employee severance and benefits costs following the elimination of approximately 80 positions from various Boingo offices across the country. Upon the completion of our restructuring plan, in addition to increased focus and alignment, we expect to realize approximately $11 million of annualized cost savings beginning in the first quarter of 2020. Network access costs totaled $29.2 million, representing a 13.1% decrease over the fourth quarter of 2018, primarily due to decreased depreciation expense related to fixed assets from our DAS build-up projects and decreased multifamily construction and support fees. Gross margin, which is defined as revenue less network access costs, was 54.3%, up approximately four points from the prior year period. The increase in gross margin largely reflects the shift in the diversified revenue streams driven primarily by the increase in higher margin DAS access fees to military revenues and declines in our lower margin DAS build and advertising revenue. Network operations expenses totaled $15 million, an increase of 11.7% year over year, primarily due to the aforementioned restructuring charge and an increase in personnel related and other expenses. Development technology expenses of $9 million increased 6.5% from the prior year period, primarily due to restructuring, higher hardware, and software maintenance expenses. Selling and marketing expenses were $6.7 million, increased 8.2% from the prior year period, primarily due to the restructuring charge. General and administrative expenses were $6.9 million, declined 14.2% year over year, primarily due to a decrease in personnel-related expenses, which is inclusive of stock-based compensation. Now, turning to our profitability measures for the quarter. Net loss attributable to common stockholders was $5.2 million, or $0.12 cents per diluted share, compared to a net income of $0.4 million, or a penny per diluted share, in the fourth quarter of 2018. As a reminder, Net income in the fourth quarter of 2018 reflected a one-time non-cash tax benefit of $5.7 million related to the reversal of our tax valuation allowance on the equity component of our convertible debt. Adjusted EBITDA, a non-GAAP measure, was $19.8 million, a decrease of 14.5% year-over-year. As a percentage of total revenue, adjusted EBITDA was 30.9% down from 34.1% of revenue in the prior year quarter. Now turning to our key metrics. The number of DAS nodes in our network for the fourth quarter was 38,100, up 27.4% from the prior year period, now 2.4% for the third quarter of 2019. The number of DAS nodes in backlog, which represents the number of DAS nodes under contract but not yet active, as of the end of the fourth quarter was 11,700, down 15.2% from the prior year period and down 3.3% from the third quarter of 2019. The decrease from the prior year period is due to the deployment of 15 new DAS venues during 2019. Our military subscriber base was 133,000 subscribers at the end of the fourth quarter, down 3.6% from the prior year period. Compared to the third quarter of 2019, military subscribers decreased 2.9%, 
in line with the anticipated seasonal trends, which typically reflect a short-term reduction in subscribers during the last few weeks of December around the holidays. Our retail subscriber base was 81,000 at the end of the fourth quarter, which was down 33.6% from the prior year period and down 4.7% from the third quarter of 2019. Next, our page usage on our worldwide network were approximately 89.4 million, up 33.1% from the prior year period, and effectively flat from the third quarter of 2019. Moving on to discuss our balance sheet. As of December 31st, 2019, cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities totaled 80.6 million, down 6.2 million from 86.8 million at September 30th, 2019. The decrease in our cash balance was primarily due to investments made in our DAS network infrastructure. Total debt was $168.4 million, and we had $150 million available in our credit facility as of December 31st, 2019. Capital expenditures were $32.2 million for the fourth quarter, which included $27.2 million for DAS infrastructure build-out projects, which are primarily reimbursed through revenue by our telecom operator partners. Free cash flow, a non-GAAP measure, was a negative $4.6 million for the fourth quarter, compared to a negative $13.7 million in the fourth quarter of 2018. For the full year of 2019, free cash flow was a negative $25 million, compared to a negative $15.4 million in 2018. While our operations continue to generate cash, these results are in line with our previously stated expectation of being a net consumer of free cash flow for the full year of 2019, primarily due to our ability to selectively fund network limit opportunities including pre-funding certain capital expenditures related to our MTA build-out projects. We continue to believe that investing the majority of our free cash flow in network expansion opportunities is the best use of capital to drive long-term growth. With that, I'll turn it back over to Mike. Thanks, Pete. Before we go to questions, I would like to say uh, I'm very excited about the year ahead. At the end of 2019, we made the tough decision to realign the company into three core business units, carrier services, military, and multifamily, as well as a fourth business unit focused on our legacy products like retail, advertising, and comes with Boingo. We believe by narrowing our focus and investment in the core areas of our business, and by managing the legacy business unit to maximize cash flow and profitability, we will be able to achieve faster growth, drive execution, and improve overall profitability for the company. Carrier services, which is comprised of DAS, Wi-Fi offload, and macro towers, remain the most important driver of long-term value for our business, and we're excited for what 2020 has in store. We're already seeing more DAS RFP activity in the first two months of the year than we saw in the first half of 2019. DAS access fee revenue is on the rise, as highlighted by the almost 50% year-over-year growth in 2019 compared to 2018. We launched 15 new DAS venues in 2019, bringing the number of total venues live to 73 and have an additional 61 DAS venues in backlog. Two venues in the backlog include the MTA Long Island Railroad and Grand Central Terminal Eastside Access Projects in New York City. We expect these MTA projects to be the largest DAS deployments in Boingo's history, and we are excited to launch the first phase of these projects later this year. Wi-Fi offload continues to be an important way that we partner with the carriers to help solve the insatiable growth of mobile data traffic. In fact, Wi-Fi offload was just named by Fierce Wireless as the second most significant wireless development of the last decade. This is incredibly exciting for Boingo as we helped pioneer the offload technology from concept to real-world deployment. While AT&T and Sprint are now live on most of our Wi-Fi network, we remain confident that it's not a question of if, but when every domestic carrier is participating in some form of offload to ease congestion on their cellular networks. As I highlighted on our last call, we extended our military contract with the Army and Air Force Exchange Service, or APES, which covers our Army and Air Force base deployments for an additional 15 years through 2038. As a result of our contract extension, we are now seeing more opportunities to continue to add coverage to support new beds and common areas on existing bases. 
Further, we believe there is a tremendous upside potential with the military for carrier offload, uh, macro cell towers, small cells, and private services as part of this long-term extension. We believe multifamily re represents an exciting long-term opportunity for Boingo, though we are just beginning to scratch the surface. REITs and developers know how crucial it is for their properties to have a top-notch wireless solution for both the residents it attracts and the rents they can charge, with high-speed internet being recognized as a top amenity. Boingo brings significant value in this regard, given our deep knowledge in the space and high-quality network solutions. In closing, we are pleased with our performance in 2019, which included several key milestones, such as the signing of a 15-year contract extension with the Army and Air Force uh, through 2038, the launch of 15 new DAS venues, and impressive year-over-year -year growth of nearly 50% in DAS access fee revenue. In addition, the business realignment, while difficult, represents an important milestone which we expect will result in a more focused, leaner, and stronger Boingo. We believe Boingo is well positioned to be a significant beneficiary of the evolving wireless ecosystem for years to come. The seemingly insatiable growth of mobile data traffic will help fuel the growth of DAS, Wi-Fi offload, CBRS, and the 5G revolution. We believe our long-term wireless rights in key strategic venues, coupled with our neutral host approach, and long-standing relationships with the carriers give us a unique ability to deliver the next generation of conversions. I am very excited for what lies ahead for our business. With that, I'll open the call to questions. Please keep in mind that we will not address any questions regarding a potential strategic transaction or 2020 guidance. Operator, you may now open the call for questions. Thank you. At this time, we will be conducting a question and answer session if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, as we poll for questions. Our first question comes from the line of Scott Zero with Roth Capital. Please see with your question. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, Pete, Mike, maybe just to quickly clarify, I want to make sure on the OPEX reduction front with the uh, the realignment, that $11 million, when will we see that full quarterly impact? Are we seeing it uh, entirely in the first quarter, or is it going to be in the second quarter that we start to see that full impact? Hey, Scott. So you'll see most of it come through in Q1. There, uh, I would say like 85 90% of, the, of, of this will be realized starting in Q1. And by Q2, 100% will be realized. Gotcha. And on the uh, the DAS front, it seems like that was an area of a little bit of sequential weakness in the fourth quarter. Uh, the pipeline is still strong. It sounds like the RFP activity is very strong. Could you take us through what exactly you saw in the fourth quarter, and are you starting to see more of a shift then to the access fee front as opposed to build revenues, and how are you trying to push things as we're moving forward? And maybe to lump on top of that, you know, in terms of that pipeline, 5G, CBRS, private networks, how does that all fit in and, and sequentially and directionally, how should we be thinking about the DAS business going from the, the December quarter into the March quarter? Thanks. Sure. I'll start, and I know Michael has some color here. So as it relates to you know, Q4 in particular, uh, first I'd like to recap, 2019 was a great year in launching 15 new venues. I know we had talked about launching more. We expected to launch a bit more here in, in Q4. Uh, those venues did not go away. Those customers did not go away. Uh, some of the, the, the timing of the launches shifted out to the right, uh, not atypical in, in these large-scale uh, construction projects, but you know, still a ton of activity going on. As it relates to your question, specifically as, uh, as, it, as it is to uh, build fees versus recurring access fees, we are seeing growth in recurring access fees. You know, year over year, uh, our, our Q4 access fees were up, up 24%. Uh, that's something we're proud of, and that, that growth is something we expect to continue uh, going forward. Uh, it, it is a trend that we are seeing, and it's something we're working on with our carrier customers. But it's important to note what we're really focused in on is getting the carriers to a yes, and so we'll, we'll be flexible with our carrier customers on whatever structure they want to do. Yeah, hey, Scott, Mike, uh, I'll just add yes about the pipeline and things. Yeah, you know, it's um, 
there, there's so much talk uh, and, con and continuous talk about 5G, which is, you know, happening and it's evolving and it's, uh, I think, 2020 and 21 we'll start to see more, especially as more devices come into the marketplace. But uh, certainly CBRS now being live, um, you know, that's uh, starting to uh, come in. But we continue to do, you know, 4G upgrades and, uh, and 4G as well. So really, you know, kind of the neutral host approach of, um, of bringing, you know, connectivity and converged connectivity into venues is going to continue to evolve. And, you know, we'll see more 4G. We'll see 5G, I think, on a, on a growing basis as we move through the year. And then bringing it all together, um, you know, with, with Wi-Fi and the other pieces is really what makes the, the best networks, and that's what the venues are seeing and asking for. Hey, Mike, if I could, just, just one follow-up, and I'll have pop back in the queue. But there's certainly been a lot of concern and speculation related to the Sprint T-Mobile impact. It seems like there's positive resolution on that front. I'm wondering if you could kind of address what you're seeing in, a, in, in that customer regard from a demand standpoint and also the talk of the fourth carrier, DISH, kind of coming in. Does that start to materialize on the revenue stream in the not-too-distant future? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, so, the, you know, I think the, the fact that it's, it's settled now is good. Um, you know, we, we build, you know, our networks for, you know, the total number of customers. So the fact that they're coming together, um, you know, is, is uh, you know, probably a good thing from that regard. Um, and uh, their number of customers is one will just be the combination, obviously, of the two. So for us, um, you know, uh, we've said all along that, you know, either way it would probably work out fine. This is a good outcome. Um, and, you know, I think we'll start to see, um, you know, those companies – uh, coming together here pretty quickly, so it's not not completely finished yet. But as that comes together, um, you know there'll obviously be a, a strong and viable uh, competitor and company in the space. Uh, as far as Dish goes, yeah, I think um, you know that's another opportunity as they evolve into um, you know uh, the fourth carrier. And um, you know as far as projecting when that will be meaningfully, you know is uh, is hard to determine, but. Um, you know, I don't. I don't think we probably we wouldn't probably see much this year, but in the out years, that that would start to happen, I believe. Great, thank you. Thank you, it's Scott. Our next question comes from the line of Anthony Stoff with Craig Hallam. Please do with your question. Hey, Mike and Pete, um, can you refresh our memory of the size of the MTA contract if it's gotten any bigger or smaller since uh, you last reported? And also. Can you maybe detail or give us a range of what you expect the size of it to be in 2021, your first full year, um, uh, I guess, of deployment? And then, uh, Mike, you, you talked about when you first joined Boingo, part of the reason you joined was your view on indoor private LTE networks being built out. I'm curious if you, what you're seeing there, if you're seeing any uh, interest in 5G already on the indoor private network side. Thanks. So I'll start off. So as it relates to the MTA contract, it, uh, it, it's not grown anything meaningfully, Tony, since uh, we, we last announced it. Uh, it's a big contract, uh, and it's, it's early in, in the process of, of our discussions with the carriers. The discussions are going quite well. The building is going on as we speak, and as we said in our last call, we expect that we will launch at least the first phase here in 2020. Uh, that has not changed. Uh, as it relates to when we'll you – know, uh, the, the entire project go live. You know, we're, we're not we're not ready to comment on that one yet, uh, and and we aren't also able to give commentary on you know what the size will it be in 2021. But uh, you know what I can say is pro it's making great progress. We are we are happy with how the teams are working. We're happy with the engagement of the carriers, and uh, we couldn't be more excited about this uh, this project. Yeah, and then Tony, I'll follow up. Yeah, I, I still think private LTE is. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a really um, interesting uh, opportunity and one that's going to grow. Um, 5G, you know, brings a lot of that into perspective, but CBRS does as well, Wi-Fi 6. So really the convergence of all of these uh, technologies and capabilities is what's going to help, I think, spur the opportunities both on the private side as well as all of indoor, you know, kind of across the board. And, um, you know, as 5G comes out further, devices get launched and capabilities uh, come more apparent um, and the app developers get moving, then, you know, there's going to be a great, uh, greater demand for high-speed, low-latency, and, um, you know, whether that's in uh, existing venues or, or private-type uh, locations. I, you know, I'm just as excited today as I was uh, when I joined almost a year ago. And as a quick follow-up, Mike, 
Uh, you commented on this call that you're seeing more uh, interest or RFP activity on DAS in the first two months than you did the first six months of 2019. Do you have a goal right now for number of DAS deployments for 2020? Um, yeah, we haven't uh, stated that, and uh, we're still working through that at this point. Okay. Thanks, guys. Best of luck. Thanks, Tony. Our next question comes to the line of Tim Horn with Oppenheimer. Please do with your question. Well, thanks, guys. Mike, can you can you talk about the, the DAS demand? Is this uh, for new venues, maybe what type of venues are you seeing, and you know, or is this for kind of 5G upgrades or you know, new carriers coming into existing locations? Any more color there? And then um, maybe, BP, can you give us a little bit more color on the wholesale Wi-Fi trends? It was a, a little weaker than, you know, we were uh, expecting. But I know there's a lot of puts and takes there. Maybe if you can give any color on some of the, uh, you know, the Amex contract or, or volume use or, you know, whatever else kind of drove the results there. I guess we're just looking for, is that number kind of a good run rate? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tim. This is Mike. I'll start, and then I'll turn it over to Pete. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's uh, clearly, if you look at the number of venues we're in, um, every one of those is a great opportunity for a 5G upgrade. Uh, and so, as we've stated, you know, that started to happen, and that will continue to evolve. Um, and we're in a great spot for that as, you know, people, uh, customers demand and, and uh, requirements for high speed and low latency just continue to grow. So, uh, that, that obviously will grow there. And as far as just the new RFPs, it really is, you know, um, there's a number of, of new facilities that are coming up. There's a lot of, um, uh, you know, different upgrades, and you know, we're we're you know we're kind of across the board in transportation hubs. Uh, anywhere there's high traffic and uh, lots of people, transportation hubs, sports stadiums, uh, uh, you know, airports and things like that. So it's you know very similar to uh, the group of customers we have today. Yeah, as it relates to wholesale Wi-Fi, Tim, so, uh, you know, yes, we were up sequentially um, very modestly. And as we look at, you know, the, the elements of, uh, of wholesale Wi-Fi, you know, we, we continue to see encouragement from what we, we're working with the carriers for offloading. Uh, we're also seeing continued success on what we call managed services, where we manage and operate venues on, on you know, wireless networks on behalf of venues. But we saw the weakness piece come from comes with Boingo, and that did materialize uh, again in, in Q4, and we continue to see that uh, you know that, that decline while the Amex program phases out. Uh, you know, we aren't giving color today as it relates to 2020, but uh, what you should be thinking of is you know wholesale offload uh, growth coming from you know managed services and uh, and uh, offload, but declines coming from comes with Boingo. And maybe just on the advertising front, what percentage of the advertising has been driven by your, your sales force? So, you know, just to try to get a baseline of what, what the run rate is at that business now that uh, you've, uh, you know, scaled that back. Yeah, so 100% of our advertising sales was coming from the sales force. So uh, we, as we went through this business realignment, that was an area where we, we definitely will see some pressure. Uh, you know, we had a larger sales force that we talked about previously, uh, you know, call it you know, all in around 20 folks, and you know that that number is significantly less when I go forward. Uh, we we were finding we were spending a lot of money supporting a business that uh, you know frankly wasn't growing, and so we you know, made corrective actions there. And uh, you know we have a handful of sellers now, but it's you know it's very small, and how we're going to market is very different. Thank you. Our next question comes to the line of James Brent with William Blair. Please do with your question. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, just just one on the housekeeping side. Can you uh, just say again how much LO it was uh, in the military number? Um, and then, you know, just across the business, military lost a few subs again this quarter. Just kind of talk about what you're seeing there. Um, and if you think that's reversing, is it more of a troop deployment issue? Um, you know, is it a little bit better than it was the last two quarters? Um, and then just on the DAS side, uh, just around the, the MTA contract, you talked a little bit about um, so sort of the timing on that, um, can you talk about how much you spent on that last year, 2019, and, and what you think that's going to come in the ballpark for 2020 from a CapEx perspective? Thanks. Sure. So as it relates to uh, multifamily, so revenue for the quarter was $6 million. Of that, uh, uh, the vast majority was uh, recurring access fees, so you know, uh, almost $4.5 million was recurring access fees. Uh, as it stands, as we 
talk about subs in the military. So we absolutely saw our, our typical seasonal decline. So our, our penetration rate as of the end of the quarter was 37.5%. So if you think about our penetration rate as an average throughout Q4, it was around 39%. So uh, it was a, you know, it was a seasonal drop. And, and you know, I can comment that, you know, like, like we normally do, we saw that come right back up in the you know, beginning of January. Uh, as it relates to MTA, uh, in terms of the, you know, the capital spent in, in uh, 2019, you know, it was uh, in the, you know, our, our overall commitments that we, we have made to MTA is over $25 million so far. Uh, we continue to fund that build uh, while we engage the carriers. Uh, I won't comment specifically on how much we will spend in 2020 on MTA because a lot of it will have to do with uh, when we launch uh, the different phases, and also, too, with which carriers, because uh, capital also is dependent upon the carriers. Uh, but just know that it has our full support, and we're, we're balancing the need to, you know, fund the network, and, 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 but also, too, making sure we're not putting capital too far in advance of getting commitments from our, from our carrier customers. Okay, and you, and you talked about realigning um, the revenue into those three buckets. Will you start reporting that way at some point? Uh, maybe in the first quarter. Uh, we, we we do intend to start uh, reporting uh, under the, the new alignment. I, I won't comment if it'll be Q1 uh, versus other time in in 2020, but but yes, we we will be uh, changing how we report. Okay, and then I just I guess the last question, you know, why not give guidance for the year? What's the rationale around that um, relative to the business and the M&A? Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean we we. We said it in our prepared comments, so it really has to do with the, the inquiries and uh, uh, just given the activity that's out there and, and the speculation rumors, we, we feel like this is not the time. Okay, thanks. Our next question comes from the line of Walter Piasek with Lightshed. Please do with your question. <coughs> thanks. Uh, hey, Mike. Um, the 73 venues that you have, I was just looking for if you can just refresh my memory in terms of how those arrangements work. Because I think if, you know, let's take Verizon as an example. If they wanted to do um, millimeter wave, which seems highly suitable to stadiums and indoor and things like that, I don't think it can go through your DAS system, so correct me if I'm wrong, that it would require a different type of antenna structure and, and system. Um, so I'm just curious if the 73 venues, if you can kind of break out which of those do you have the exclusivity to be the guy that would then build that um, for Verizon? And, you know, I guess AT&T or whoever else wants to build a uh, millimeter wave in those venues. What, what, what do the financial arrangements look like generically um, across those 73 venues? Um, and would you suspect that in those cases it would be kind of the traditional business model that you did historically, which is like you get – VZ and T to, to pony up a couple of a couple of million bucks and then and then just amortize that as deferred revenue. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Walter. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk generically, obviously, but um, sure. I'll try to take your your question as it is. So, um, in all of the venues where we have the rights, we have the rights. So uh, the first question would be all 73. We would have the rights to do that. As far as the design and the build out. Um, it would really be dependent on, you know, the venue itself, the carrier, uh, what spectrum they're planning to use. You've stated millimeter wave and understand the question. So in those cases, um, it's a little bit more specific to that. Um, but, um, you know, the, the way that we operate with the operators, we do in the same manner with, you know, uh, 5G and upgrades as we've done with 4G and the 3G. And then um, as we build it out, then it's just a function of, working with them on, um, you know, where and how they want to deploy as we, you know, do with all the other venues and all the other upgrades in history we have. And from a contractual perspective, it's the same. So, so again, for the 73, it is exclusive across all 73, meaning that if they, if they want to do millimeter wave, even if it's more CapEx, that's, it can only go through you guys in terms of those contracts. And how long, on average, are those contracts extend? I mean, they, they're, they're, the first answer is yes, but um, the contracts have varying degrees. As you know, we have we all we enter into long-term contracts, um, and um, you know we don't claim and to describe what every one of them are, but you know they all tend to be, you know, longer term. Got it. And then on the um, 
Um, Pete, a uh, question for you on the, you know, my favorite question, which is this reimbursable capex. You actually, I want to ask. I know you're not giving what you're going to do in 2020 or targeting, but even in this year, I think the last time we ch chatted about this, you were looking at doing 75 to 90 total with the mix between self-funded and and uh, carrier funded, and so you came in substantially above that. Was any of that conceptually pulling in 2020? Like, how, how did that happen? Um, that it was that much higher than, than what you were initially thinking? Or am I, do I have the numbers wrong? Yeah, so you, uh, those were some earlier numbers. Uh, when, we, when we last gave guidance, we, we talked about our, our DAS CapEx for the year being 95, between 95 and 105. So uh, gotcha. for the year, we came at 107, so even a little bit above that. It's driven by care demand. So uh, when we look at you know, what, what we have going on in, as it relates to upgrades, new venue deployment, as well as supporting the MTA build process, uh, we continue to see you know, a significant amount of demand, and that's, you know, that's a very good thing. Gotcha. And then the last thing, um, so if, if I just took DAS rev divided by nodes, first of all, why is that bad to do it that way and create a new metric? Um, and then also, like, does 200 sound like that should be the right number per month for the revenue generated per node? I, I get that it's like it can be squirrely because you're amortizing some of the revenue, but actually, it, it, even if with amortization, it still should work out to, to be a clean type of metric. Does 200 bucks per node per month sound like the right number, or can that go lower? Because that's been obviously dropping. Yeah, I know, I know exactly what you're trying to do here. I, I, the, yep. the, the challenge with that is it works really well for new venue deployments, but as you start doing upgrades and as carriers add incremental nodes, uh, when, they, when they do these upgrades, uh, the same rent does not apply, and so as a result, you know your your revenue per node by you know by default is going to go down as a result of upgrades. So it it's a proper and a good way to think about it, and, and it's how I will look at it internally when I think about you know uh, anchor carriers and subsequent carrier additions to a, a new venue, but upgrades kind of change the whole dynamic uh, that comes into play, and then. And then it has to do with at what point does a, a carrier decommission a node, and that's something that we don't get uh, you know, the color on that as quick as, as we would like. Thanks. And just one last one. What, what, NOLs, do what, what are your NOLs? And, and, I mean, is the bottom line here on the strategic alternative is that it's really that exclusivity that people want in terms of the next phase of investment? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have the NOLs in front of me, but uh, we're in a you know a net loss position. They expect to be a non-cash taxpayer for you know for a while. Uh, yeah, as look, people look at Boingo for different things, but you know one of the things we continue to say is you know the fact that we have long-term key strategic uh, venues and that we provide wireless connectivity in those venues and have a great history of getting multiple carriers per location, it uh, it makes us valuable. Uh, and, and to, to different players and also to just, you know, just in terms of growing the business. It's, you know, winning venues, signing up carriers to locations creates real value. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Thanks Walter. Walter. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Our next question comes from the line of Greg Gibbett with Northland Capital. Please do with your question. Good afternoon, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, you talked a lot about the profitability benefits that you're getting from the restructuring. Um, but roughly, how much will the recent restructuring impact revenue, uh, if in any way at all? So I'll, I'll, I'll take on this. Uh, the, the area where we expect to see the most impact uh, around the realignment really has to do with the advertising business, in which we we've talked about previously. So. Uh, you know, there's been questions and commentary we receive when we talk to the investment community that um, we are abandoning our legacy business, and that is not the case. Uh, but what we are doing is we're putting a lot of focus on the areas of the business that are growing and that we believe create the most value. And the areas that are not growing as much, you know, we're, we're managing them, but we're doing it responsibly. And so everything we do is going to be managed in a way that we look at you know, what's, what's the opportunity, what's the cost, and then how can we, you know, maximize, you know, the overall contribution margin? Uh, we have a leader responsible for the legacy business, and he's absolutely trying to grow the business. It's going to be tough. You know, when you look at retail, you look at advertising, you look at comes with Boingo, those businesses are under decline. Uh, 
but doesn't mean that they don't generate you know, good incremental contribution margin, and that's how we're running the business. Okay, sure. Uh, and then if you think about the comes with Boingo program, having that continued negative effect on that wholesale Wi-Fi segment, um, how should we think about when Amex will be completely phased out and maybe when that part of the segment would return to growth? Yeah, unfortunately, it kind of gets into the whole 2020 guidance piece. So uh, uh, you, you should be thinking about Annex phasing out in the in the early part of the year. But beyond that, I really can't comment. Okay, fair enough. Uh, last one for me then would just be, you know, as that DAS penetration moves closer to 12% maybe in the market today, um, is there any, can you talk about the dynamics about maybe, have you noticed a slowing pace of new venues coming to market or maybe the mix of venues that has shifted at all? And I guess kind of how would accompany that with maybe what verticals or venue types you're excited about for the DAS business in 2020? Yeah, I, I, I can touch base. I know Mike can go a bit more, but look, the, the, the demand from, from carriers and venues for in-building wireless is at, is at great levels. You know, we, we talked a bit about the, you know, how our RFP activity is, is heavier. Uh, that's driven by venues, but we also continue to get feedback from carriers. And you think about a 5G world, and 5G, you know, is, you know, it's almost was made for in-building wireless when you think about, you know, how that works and how you become most efficient. So we, we love the position we're in, and we, we, we love what we're trying to do. So uh, I like the space that we occupy about, you know, running the, the wireless networks at key strategic locations and bringing in as many carriers as possible and leveraging that shared infrastructure for healthy returns for us, for the carriers, as well as the, to the venues. It's a true win-win-win. Yeah, and all, all I'll add is, you know, you obviously, if you break it up, you have, you know, a, a whole grouping of existing venues of all types, transportation hubs, airports, uh, sporting venues, things like that. Um, and you have, you know, some that are new, and, you know, there's new building going on in multiple places around the country. And then you always have, you know, some sort of new um, opportunity or new new type of, uh, of venue, you know, there's some gaming things uh, that, that are starting to happen. But there's a common denominator in all of them, which is they all want, you know, the fastest, uh, you know, uh, highest speed, lowest latency network that you can get. So whether you're in an existing one, one that's being built or one that's coming, they all want the same thing. So if we're in the places, uh, you know, where we're at, then those are, you know, we would consider that upgrade opportunities. If there's new venues, you know, our approach on a neutral side and bringing all types of network and capabilities together is very appealing uh, to those venues and for the ones that would be coming, it would be any different. So, you know, as we move on, you know, over the next pick your time frame, 12, 24, 36 months, and, you know, devices are coming out and capabilities come out and app developers get involved, you know, some of the things like we saw in 4G, you know, for example, Uber and Lyft were not use cases for 4G uh, network spectrum. So, uh, you know, we, we envision there'll be more of that, and we think we're in a good spot for that. Got it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of John Gotter with Lake Street Capital Markets. Please do with your question. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my question. First, on military, obviously we saw a nice ARPU increase there um, driven by the price increase. Is there more room uh, for that to go up going forward? And you know, what are you thinking about as far as ARPU versus adding new beds? Uh, and second, on the multifamily, it was kind of consistent commentary over the past couple quarters of elongated sales cycles. Um, anything else changed there that's worth calling out? Thank you. Sure. So I'll, I'll start here. So as it relates to ARPU and military, uh, yes, we've had some great ARPU uh, increases you've seen, you know, materialize over 2019. Uh, you know, the bulk of that had to do with the, you know, the service and, and price increase that happened uh, in the, started at least in the early part of 2019. So I don't expect a material amount of incremental ARPU increases in 2020. Uh, you know, I think we've talked about that in the past, so I'm, I'm comfortable sharing it. Uh, we can, as we talked about in the last call as well, you know, we continue to look at opportunities to add new beds. Uh, that is something that we think is important. As we, you know, extended our contract with APES and have another 15 years giving us, you know, a contract through 2038, we're looking at certain venues that at one point, you know, we we uh, we, we question uh, as we brought down the cost to deploy these bases and have longer term. It ha allows us to look at bases a little bit differently. So uh, I do expect to add beds, but uh, you know, not ready yet to provide color as to how much. 
Yeah, and then on the, the, the multifamily side, I'd say, um, you know, when we acquired Elowit, they were primarily in student housing, and we continue to be in that business and grow it. But as we've um, also shifted into the more commercial multifamily side, that's where it gets uh, – the, the sales cycle has been a little longer. Um, but if you think in terms of this decade, there's, you know, estimated to be 20% growth of uh, multifamily units um, annually over the next 10 years. And so we're in the, you know, beginning of that cycle, and, and the reality of it is, you know, some of those – properties that we're working with today are dirt uh, for the new buildings, and, you know, those those can take, you know, pick your time frame, 12, 24 months to build out. And then, you know, the, the massive uh, number of existing properties, um, you know, have a combination of uh, some that have contracts associated with them that will roll off over time. And although they're built, uh, there's a great uh, benefit to that that we can, you know, get on with. Um, uh, implementing our, our uh, technology there, but there's people living in them and there's walls and things, so it takes a little time to kind of get that going. So it's a big opportunity, um, and on the commercial side, it just is one that has a little longer cycle than uh, some of the student housing stuff. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Sean. Our final question comes to the line of Kyle McNeely with Jeffries. Please see with your question. Hi, thanks for the question. Uh, I wanted to get a sense for where you're at with small cells right now. Uh, are you seeing more and more projects become small cell focused right now, or do you have an expectation when they might um, become more small cell focused in the future or ramp more meaningfully? Yeah, there, there's actually, I mean, this is kind of one that's been coming for a long time, and uh, I, I do think that there's probably more activity that's starting to uh, to happen on the small cell side. and. Um, you know, again, as a neutral provider and provider of all types of technology, um, you know, there's I think there's some interesting opportunities that that will probably start to finally come into play here over the next uh, you know period of time. Um, uh, but you know, it's, it, for us, it's kind of one part of providing all types of uh, connectivity and converged connectivity. So uh, I do think it's you know obviously a little closer than it's probably been in the past. Okay. Fair enough. Um, and is there anything more that you can say about um, any kind of leading indicators like RFP activity and upgrade requests? Uh, you mentioned some factors there earlier in the call, um, but could, could um, th that could help us understand where we're at with the timing of carriers' 5G plans. I know you previously said that it could be mid 2020 when we could see a bigger ramp in uh, 5G, uh, you know, 5G in venues. Uh, but is that still your thought, or uh, you know, what are you thinking currently about the timing of a 5G ramp? Well, I, I'll just I'll, I'll just give you maybe a little more historical, um, as I've kind of commented over the, the last number of, of times, is uh, 5G will ramp faster than 4G did. Um, you know, the combination of, of um, you know, chips and capabilities uh, being um, pr uh, available, uh, infrastructure being up and more, you know, global in nature than 4G was. Um, and then, you know, what really drives a lot of it is devices that have the capabilities. And so, um, you know, there's been a lot of announcements by, um, uh, you know, chip guys and by device players of having, um, you know, devices available. And generally, when you see that, um, you know, they, they, the devices don't tend to come until infrastructure is built. So, you know, uh, the carriers are best to answer that question for them. But um, I would just tell you, I think that 5G, you know, all the, the discussion and uh, uh, information that's come about 5G uh, will be faster. And, I, you know, I think... Uh, as devices come more towards the middle end of this year, you'll start to see some of that that happen. Okay, and then one more on, on multifamily. Um, I guess uh, where are you at with uh, with the um, agreements and and how they're progressing with uh, with the, the many REITs across the U.S. and um, you know maybe outline the stage of the process you're in right now and maybe some milestones or some kind of expectation on timing there. Yeah, I mean, you know, we continue to have great discussions and, and relationships, as I've said before. Although we don't have um, you know, a, uh, you know, a, a large uh, scale agreement with, with any of the REITs. We do work with all the REITs on a regular basis, and uh, we are, you know, uh, working with them on properties. Um, so nothing to report there uh, yet, but, um, you know, we're continuing to uh, work with them and 
uh, and grow, you know, uh, opportunities with them as we move forward. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of our question and answer session as well as today's conference call. We thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your lines at this time and have a wonderful day.